Everyone, welcome to the Electric Supercar Channel. I am the EV Doctor. Today we have Clifford, the big red truck. We're gonna do some diagnosis. So Clifford, what seems to be the problem? Before we get into your medical history, I need you to bend over and drop them. All right, now I'm gonna need you to turn your head and cough. <coughs> <coughs> All right, some patient stats for Clifford. Born in 1965, this is a Ford F100, and it was undergoing an EV conversion. This is when the patient started having some sharp shooting pains on the passenger side. Symptoms were a loud pop and some smoke. I enjoy having fun with you guys, but in all seriousness, everybody is on their own path and various degrees on their progression to becoming a better car builder. So with that in mind, the theme of today's episode is going to be, we listen, but we don't judge. So I'm gonna walk you through what I do to die diagnose, show you what the problems are, and lay out the plan of what we're going to do to fix them. So stay tuned while we diagnose what's wrong with Clifford. So let's get started. This customer came to me because they had an electrical incident right, electrical incident. Basically when the car was turned on, there was kind of a pop, loud noise, and smoke, and anyway, some chaos. And so they just said, hey, things are happening that uh, are not good. Would you take a look at this, fix it, get it running? So that's what we're doing. We've got to figure out what's going on. So let me show you what we found. Unloading this truck off the trailer had a few issues. There was some grinding going on and we figured out that it was actually, tie rod end was actually kind of contacting the inside of the wheel. Took delivery of this one. We actually are having to put it on some wheel dollies because we got a little bit of an interference problem. Hey, Brayden, we we'll probably need some man help. So it's on dollies, so we don't need to steer or anything. We just need to push. Okay, John, you're steering because I can't see. We measured, we're good. <laughs> I think it just probably the wheel got stuck in the crack. Let's see if we can shift this guy over again. <laughs> I'm just not a bad angle. There. So Braden, watch the wood. You're gonna have to do some steering. I think we made it. There are also quite a few issues with the wheels. Let me tell you about some of those. We just took off the wheel. So these were the lug nuts that were on the outside. I'll show you on the other wheel, but uh, we're thinking that these were actually supposed to go here because those ones don't sink in far enough to let wheels sit all the way against that spacer. So here it is on the other side. Um, you see, these are the ones that I think are supposed to be on the inside because the inside ones look a little more direct decorative, but there is space right here where it's not quite sitting against the wheel hub. So you can see my finger sits in between there. And I think the reason why it can't sit there is because those nuts on the inside won't let this sit all the way. So you see this, this is not a machined bevel. This is actually where the wheel was contacting the tie rod end. So basically as it, they were unloading the vehicle uh, at the shop here, it took us a while to figure out what was going on, but uh, the wheels have some spacing issues. It even uh, looks like it took off some of the wheel weights. We'll have to get these rebalanced. So basically this is where it was grinding on the wheel. And at first we thought, well, maybe they had like bent an arm or something, but actually this position cannot change. So this position also cannot change. There was nothing bent. Um, we looked at the wheel setup and there's quite a few things going on that needed some correcting. So these are the wheel spacers that were on there and this kind of lip is actually supposed to go inside here. So when we put it on, not sure you can tell, but basically there's a gap, meaning that lip is a little too big and it doesn't quite sit down. So the face of the tire or the face of the wheel, this face is not touching this face, which is kind of important. Also really for the hub centric spacers, you really wanna make sure this fits well with your wheel. The other thing, this wheel spacer has quite a bit of gap, you know, so you really want that again, fitting really nicely on the hub. The other thing, the wheel hub was secured with these lug nuts. So a couple issues with these lug nuts. Number one, again, you'll see the wheel could not sit up against this surface because of these as well. So I mean, that was, the wheel was gonna stand off there. That's a really not a great thing. The other thing, let me show you. So this this is the lug nut that was used to secure it. And the problem is this is not the right thread size. That is insane, right? It, it threads in like that's the right thread size, but it is really loose. So this is an M12 by 125. This is a 7 16 20 tap. That's tight, right? No wiggle room. This is not the right lug nut for this hub. So one of the other things we noticed is there is a big disparity in brakes. 
So I've got a couple of images here, but you can see the back brakes and rotors are significantly larger than the front. The rears are four piston calipers, the fronts are just one piston calipers. For stopping purposes, you would really rather have the front brakes be a little more aggressive than the rear. So this current setup is quite bad for braking, even if you have a proportioning valve. On my blue car, on Watson, I actually have four pistons in the front and four pistons in the back, and it still had to use the proportioning valve kind of all the way to the front to get it so the rears wouldn't lock up before the front. What we're gonna do is we're gonna replace the front hubs. So we're gonna get new rotors, new hubs, and new brakes. We're gonna do six piston calipers up front. This should really help with the stopping power. It should also provide the spacing we need to get the tie rods away from the wheels while still maintaining the wheel spacing that he wants. One other issue this had with wheels or suspension is on the rear. So when I took off the rear wheel to kind of get access to some of the wiring, I noticed that there was a problem. So this is supposed to have something on the end. So this part had broken off. You can see it's bent. And so it just sheared right off. Um, this car had utilized, it looks like a prefabricated bracket. So it's going to be a little challenging to show you just because the t spacing is tight. But basically they used this part on the suspension right up here. And uh, this is too wide. And you can see they're not parallel anymore. But uh, because it was, they had some unique spacers and uh, hardware geometry, this was also, I'll say at the wrong angle, I think it would have been better like this. It was like this. So that means the suspension could go this way, but not this way. And that's kind of the way the wheels travel is you want it to be able to kind of pivot back and forth. So they had a mount up top there and it wasn't quite in line. And so basically when it was under load, it kind of bent. One of them was bent, the other one broke off. Needless to say, we're gonna to have to redo the rear suspension geometry. So back to the theme of the episode, we listen, but we don't judge. Everybody's gonna be at their own experience level in their building cars progression. So there's gonna to be tons of people that are way better than me, but I feel like it's a good idea to help everybody understand what some of these issues are and how we can learn from it. So again, we listen, but we don't judge. There is now a level zero. So we're gonna help the customer out. We're gonna get this all sorted so it's nice and neat. For today's sponsor, we have Tesman. This is a brake fluid tester. All right. So you might be wondering what you would need to use something like this for. This is to test your brake fluid and more specifically the moisture content in your brake fluid. So the way brakes work is they rely on incompressible fluid to apply the braking pressure. The problem with moisture, water is incompressible, but basically when your brakes heat up, if it gets above boiling, then all of a sudden that becomes a gas, which is very compressible. That's why we wanna make sure to keep moisture out of the brake lines. We've got a lot of vehicles here. Some of them come in and we don't know kind of what condition they're in, how their brakes are. It's a good idea to have something like this. We can make sure the brakes and the braking system is working properly. This is the Nissan we've been working on for some time. It's got some brake fluid in, so we're gonna go ahead and do some testing. So all we do is we push the button, it'll turn on, Right here, it's got 0.0, .0 so we'll go ahead and try it out and see what moisture content we've got. Yeah, C starts with zero. Go ahead and put it in. It'll give us the reading. All right, you see uh, this is dot three brake fluid. On here, it also says dot three. You can also do dot four or dot 5.1. So this vehicle had been sitting for 37 years. I figured if any vehicle had bad, this one might have bad, so we'll check it. As you can see, if you hold the S button, it will hold the value. That is the H here. And you can do that until you can record it properly. This product has an eight and a half inch flexible probe. It has a hold function so it can keep the data till you can document it properly. All this for about 17 bucks. So if you're interested in a product like this, I'll leave a link in the video description below. So there are several places around the car underneath the battery boxes that have got the blue leaking out of it. So that is the coolant. I think it's usually that G48 uh, coolant that's for electric vehicles. So we've got that in several places, which makes me worried that uh, we've got leaking inside the battery box. We also back here on the motor, um, looks like they've kind of done a coolant delete. I'm not sure where they got it from, but uh, not quite sealed there as well. So we got this truck on the lift now, but what we're gonna do is that we're actually gonna take out the seat because that's where most electronics are kind of situated behind the seat. So we're gonna take out that and kind of look at the electronics, see what we gotta work with. All right, 
much better. So this will give us access to all the wires and uh, all the components that we need to check out what we can do to fix this. So my plan is uh, in order to kind of get access to all the wires, they've got a lot of the wires underneath the frame rails. So what I'm gonna do to access those, I'm actually gonna drop the battery packs and that'll give us good access to check out and diagnose all the wires. So first we gotta undo, disconnect and drain all the coolant. Okay, well apparently there's not much coolant in here. Still not much. We're okay with that. And also disconnect the high voltage as well as low voltage to the battery boxes. Oh man, I spent probably the last hour trying to get these connectors out. So they've got uh, connectors in between the battery boxes. So these are the connectors. So the only challenge is you had to get like a screwdriver from the backside up here to kind of pry that. Basically it, the tab is on the top side. So you can see some of those ones that are still there. And then there's like part of the frame that's in between. So you can't really get anything longer than that up there. So I was using this to try and get up there with your hands and oh my gosh, it took so long. The other thing that aided was this guy. So again, I do a lot better if I can see what's going on. So great to have a little boroscope tool. We've got uh, this battery pack that is disconnected. So we've got the coolant hoses as well as the high voltage and even the cell taps and low voltage connections are all gone on this one. So we're gonna go ahead and put my rolling table under here. We're gonna lower the lift so it's basically on top of the table and then we will uh, undo the bolts and then just raise up the lift. Battery box is out. Now we get to see kind of the damage. So we're under the car, this is looking back. So that is the bed of the truck. It looks like they did the whole rear subframe from the Model S. That's a great way to go. And this is where we had the issue. And he thinks, and I think I agree, what happened is he was uh, drilling and tapping holes to mount things. And I believe it's this hole right here. Basically it came up and I don't know if you can see that, but this is a high voltage wire and it looks like just a little bit of bare copper is exposed there, which makes me think they probably just nicked it with the drill or tap. And that's kind of what caused a lot of that uh, issue there. So that is only half of what's going on though. So basically for a battery to, I'll say conduct or have a lot of energy be discharged, you actually need to create a circuit. So meaning I think this was one spot. Let me show you where the other spot is. So here's the battery box. Can you tell where the other spot might be? So we will need to take the top off here, but uh, something tells me that uh, maybe we've got a lead or something that's uh, contacting or too close uh, to the battery box. Basically, this is one point that was conducting. The other point was the, what we saw under the car. All right, we're gonna do some quick tests just to see if we're isolated from the box. So 185 volts. So we're gonna see if either one, so that one's good. But it seems like it's least isolated from the box. I'm concerned just cause we got a big old scorch spot there, melted spot that we might be contacting. But uh, it seems like we're at least good at some level. So this is the isolation meter. All right, I was hoping that just you could pry it from the edge. So you don't have to stick the screwdriver down and just Try it out, it's not gonna work. So we're gonna use some of these plastic wedges so I don't have to drive something metal down there. Wow. So indeed we can see some coolant leaking, so we definitely don't want that. So we'll see if we can figure out, looks like there's at least some right here as well on that manifold. So we'll see if we can figure out where the leaks are. But um, for now, I also wanna to go to the other side where our catastrophic event happened. All right, so this is the other side. Again, we just see a little bit of coolant here. Up here, you can see a little bit of melting of the insulation and uh, right above here. So kind of where this, where we've got a spot that looks like on through. So I don't know that we'll be able to see that until we take the top off.
All right, so if anybody hasn't seen it, these are the Tesla cells, and it looks like they're stacked three deep. So this is three here, three there, so six, seven, eight. So they've got eight here. Usually to get up to 400 volts, you need 16. So this is half of it, the other half is still in the car. So I'll show you right here, looks like where things happened. I'm not quite sure because I would think that, I'll call it the sheathing, was still on this one. So that's a little interesting to me. You might be asking, so what are we gonna do now? So let me tell you some of my thoughts. I think first we've got to take out each module and kind of check all the cells, um, check the connections, make sure that everything looks good. The other thing we have to do is we have to look at the connections of all the coolant because there's some coolant leaks that we also don't want to see. Lastly, we'll need to address this one, which was the one that failed here. And we'll have to see if we want to do a bus bar or just remake one of these, uh, make sure it's got enough clearance. But yeah, all in all, I don't think this pack looks too bad. I really don't. So I think I figured out what went on and I'm going to give the final diagnosis. So for the battery box side, I'm pretty sure what happened, this is kind of where it uh, was touching or arcing. And I think what happened is they've kind of drilled and tapped these holes on the side to kind of fasten the top down. So you can see like spacing, I think right there, they probably drilled and tapped what they thought was aluminum, but probably just the actual cable. So that kind of created one path for the electricity. The other path was right here. You can see just that drop of copper. So again, this is another place where they drilled and tapped and they probably just went a little too far and nicked that as well. So when the bolt was fastened here, because there was a bolt that went up here, it was touching that. And then the other one was touching the battery box. So we got essentially a circuit that was created through those points. And so that caused enough heat excitement that uh, kind of started a little fire here, as well as kind of uh, burning and melting through the aluminum here. This all seems very fixable, so we'll get to it. Basically, I think we're gonna have to redo some of the high voltage cables. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of the other circuits, make sure everything's looking great. The other thing is we've gotta take care of any sort of leaks that uh, are happening. All right, so that's gonna do it for this episode. I'm just gonna recap real quick about some of the things we found. The first thing we found offloading it from the trailer was there's some grinding coming from the front wheels and the front wheels were actually touching the tie rod ends. Then we dug into the main complaint, which was the shooting pains or the fire that happened on the passenger side. So we did find that there was a high voltage short on the passenger side that caused somewhat of a little fire. Also on the driver side in the battery box that caused it to actually burn through the battery box. So we found that the reason for that was they had drilled and tapped and actually breached or cut through the uh, shielding and sheathing, contacted a bolt that was holding the battery box on. And then on the other side, there was another problem where they drilled and tapped into another cable. So basically that created a short circuit and that's what created all the fire. A couple other cleanup things we're gonna do. We noticed that the high voltage junction box could be a little bit better. We noticed that the plug for the motor had some stray wires and some copper that we could see. So we're gonna fix that one as well. When we were looking at that, we took off the tire and we also found that the suspension was broken or at least the shock absorber. So we're probably gonna redo the suspension as well. One last thing we noticed there is a big, big difference between the front brakes and the rear brakes. So we will probably also fix that so we can have better stopping and not lock up the rear brakes before we lock up the front brakes. We also noticed that there's some coolant leaking. So we dug into that and found out where all the leaks were. So I'm sure we'll find at least one or two more things along the way. Stay tuned while we fix all these. This one we're hoping to get done in about a month. So I know there's a lot of people saying, hey, just focus on one. I wanna see one driving. It takes a long time to build these custom cars. And this one we're hoping to get done in a month. So we'll hopefully get that to you real soon. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. We measured, we're good. <laughs> place in their everybody's going to be at their own experience level in their building cars